Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. The church are going to mandate. Get it on. Thanks for tuning that in. That is a damn Thanks fine sure. opening. Thanks, Daryl Hammond in <laughs> studio. Really good. Daryl's got a uh, it's got uh, date coming up. Uh, yeah. That's coming up August 16th at the uh, Hollywood Improv. And uh, our friend Jay Moore is mm-hmm. going to be with him mm-hmm. as well. So you do not want to miss that one. Yeah, it's like an SNL alumni thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, What's and happening? you guys, I mean, you guys are, are great stand ups just in your own right. Uh, he, minus I, I the bl- alumni, minus <sighs> the, the voices and impersonations. I mean, I've seen both of you just be straight stand up multiple times, and you're very good. Okay, good. Because uh, I think he's wonderful as a stand up, and <clears throat> I try to keep up with him. We, we go, we've taken that impression show to casinos before, and then we do stand up before the show, and he's fun to watch and tough to follow. He's really good. Uh, I, I, would, I would even say underrated. In sure. this, in the stand-up department, I, makes sense to me. I mean, he's a he's a real kill master. Yeah, you started an uh, SNL after Jay, right? Like right after him, or is it um, uh, uh, several years after? I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know how many that is. Five or six years after. Um, we uh, we were talking on a show last week. We were uh, talking about uh, Chris Hansen from uh, To Catch a Predator. And uh, Kyle Dunnigan was doing his uh, his Chris Hansen. And then I thought, I wonder if Daryl Hammond has a Chris Hansen somewhere. I don't. And then I thought, I don't think he does. But not then, many people do. Not honest. many people do. But then I thought it would be interesting to see the process, to be right. involved with the process of doing a voice. Because right. you're sitting there at SNL, and at some point you get assigned a voice, I'm, right. I'm guessing. Yeah. And then you have to sort of go to work on it, I, I'm, you know, like, like any other job. Like and you've got to break it down fast, too. There's, oh. not, there's, not to, there's no time. I mean, because that's, that's only one thing that you're working on. Right. So you have a, a couple of days to get your voice together. Yeah, Thursday and Friday. And yeah. then I was so I was like thinking if we played you a little Chris Hansen, uh-huh. could we see that process? What if I got what if I got nothing? Or you may have nothing. Okay. That's an that's an alternative. Sure. I have nothing. Yeah. What is your you usual process? You would be in process? great company to not have anything. The process the the first thing is where does it occur in the throat, you know? Is it is it in the back? Is it in the top? <laughs> You know, is it down here in the back? You know, so you just mess around first. Where in the mouth? Where, where is would, it coming out of? Yeah. You know, usually, I, I, it's coming with most people. It's coming out of your chest. It's more in. It's more in here. Uh-huh. It's more in here. You know, but then you see that, and uh, let's see. Are you going to play something? Yeah, yeah. we'll play. Uh, we'll play a little, Chris. Okay. They were all prosecuted. Fifty-one guys surfaced in three days. When the this is not that Chris Hansen-y. Don't, oh, uh, the, oh they're, they're very panicked because imagine we have this house in Riverside. It's a good-sized house, probably a five-bedroom house. They come in. Okay. Now, this is the third time we've done it, right? So some of the guys actually are starting to recognize me. Not many in that case, but some. And <laughs> they go through this interrogation, this interview with me, and then they leave. They walk out the door. And a team of sheriff's deputies grab him and take him to a nearby motorhome. That's how we did that case. And he was interrogated in the motorhome. And then a police car, sheriff's car, took him away for processing. So, so by the so way, busy. I heard this interview. The, the guys interviewing him just asked him what he did this summer. <laughs> and, then, and this was, I said, go to Knott's Berry Farm when he asked me. But Chris was busting perps. Yeah. I All mean, right. I, so I, I what would, would you do with uh, something like that? Uh, the first thing I do is I'd have someone transcribe the things that we just heard, uh huh. And then I would look at the the par the different. It's probably like th- five, six paragraphs, and I look at the different paragraphs and see the places where he he repeats a sound, mm-hmm. like a sound that he, that he just either stays in or repeats. You know, um. At the very end, he did something that, that I think was where I would start. Um, say, just, if you could play the last 20 seconds or so 
Um, again, I don't know if you can do that. But, he, but That's how we did that case. And he was interrogated in the motorhome, and then a police car, sheriff's car, took him away for processing. So it got so busy in that particular investigation. I mean, imagine 51 guys showing up in three days mm-hmm. that guys were being arrested as other guys were showing up. And so okay. they would call the decoy and say, um, the way he says 51 guys, you know, that's kind of 51 guys, <laughs> right? 51 guys. That's a good end. I would start with that <laughs> 51 guys, but he does, he does a couple of other things as well that are kind of interesting. And then I, so you find like a hook. Yeah. Probably would have to see it, but the, 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 the way he, t- he takes himself very seriously, you know, really seriously. Um, I would start right in there. Does uh, yeah, you could do it, Chris Hansen. The part. <laughs> so you'd like physically watch, like you're watching game film, sure, and then transcribe it, and then grab. Start with the hooks. I even would would freeze frame, like I would take Polaroids. Of the way they their mouth looked with all the vowels, E I O U, like the way that the way they so that I was forming my lips in the same way they formed theirs, you know, because everyone's everyone's consonants sound the same on the sonar. They look the same and sound the same, you know, the plosives, right? It's in the vowels where the humanity is, right? Mm-hmm. So I would start as isolating those vowels, and I, if I was uh, going to have to get them ready for airtime, say the next eight hours or so, I'd pick a vowel sound that he made, hopefully two that he made, and I would I would uh, I tell the writers about it, and I say let let's have some U's and some O's, really, because I mean, listen, you're trying to do something Friday night at Saturday morning at one a.m. What is the least prepared you've been on a voice? Like where you just went, I don't think I have this one when the on air light hits on that camera. <laughs> there have been a number, a number of them. You know, I, there was one where um, I was trying to do Bobby Knight, the Indiana basketball coach. I mean, I got that that day a few hours before. And, um, that's not enough time. He's a complicated dude. Yeah. I mean, you know what I mean? If you're really... Well, lo- I mean, the good... I mean, Bobby Knight is, you know, you have no time to prep, but most of America does not know exactly what he sounds like. So you have some wiggle room as long as there's a chair that's for you to throw. That's an important note because there are a lot of times there are people who are famous for what they say, but not how they say it. Right. No, they don't have a distinctive voice in people's minds yet. Right. But... They know the stuff they say in the, that uh, in movies and so forth. So Bobby Knight was a tough one. It just wasn't enough time. Did you did you ever get out there and you get in the middle of a sketch and you're like thinking to yourself, I'm losing this voice or I'm not. Yeah. I'm, and, I don't have a handle yeah, on this and voice. That's why I would always create a handle ahead of, ahead of time, you know, like um, that I would go back to. You know, like with Sean Connery, it was, um, you don't have to think about it, just nod. <laughs> right. <laughs> just nod. Right. So you, you go almost like, I mean, it's like a comedian saying, get her done. Or, uh, you know, there, here's your, oh, God, there's your clue. Or sometimes, you know, it's like, like a catchphrase that, that if you felt like you were stumbling a little bit or you didn't have your yeah, hands wrapped a, around it, you go gar- to the one you know. Yes. Yes, you you especially if it's a brand new voice, you find as many places in your appearance where you can make a sound. If maybe in the maybe maybe it's just you've had it for eight hours, five hours, Jesus. so you just have to make a sound and pick a couple of sounds if you're lucky. I mean, like if you're lucky, it's like you know, um, say like Bill, Phil Donahue is like uh, you're a blue collar guy. You're married 20 years to the same woman. How many times can people eat lasagna? I mean, <laughs> and we will be back in just a moment. So now if you take that and pull that further in the back, you get uh, Ted Koppel, ABC News. All right, mm-hmm. right. So if you're lucky, you know, they're, they're close. They're things that you've done before. Do you, uh, you ever turn down a voice? Like you just go, not enough time, 
not going to be able to do it. I think, you know, that when Will Ferrell stopped doing W and they wanted me to do a version of W that was very close to his, if not his, entirely. Uh huh. And then gradually become something else. Uh huh. They, the impact of his impression of W was so big. They couldn't just leave off and, as if it never happened. They had to see evolve away from that. And I just wasn't able to do that. I wasn't able to do, you know, Will Ferrell. Will Ferrell doing W. Yeah, and it, it I mean, whatever, whatever, I don't know, even know why. Just my, my brain wouldn't go there. Is uh, Well, do you think you're sort of a conscientious objector, like I'm – doing somebody else's impersonation of this guy, not you my know, own? I've, I've been sensitive for, for a long time about how easy it is for people who have transformative abilities to really steal an impression. You know, it'd be like you're looking at a sculpture in the museum. I could get, I'm way closer to be able to sculpt a, a human frame because of Michelangelo's David. Right. I mean, it, 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 you know, when in doubt... Let's bu- look over here for the pectoralis major. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's a der- you derive from it. So I've been sensitive about that. I mean, when I was doing Clinton and I was doing um, the thumb and the lip thing, you know, the, right. the thing, people were doing that. I saw a guy do it on TV, and I, I never saw Clinton do that. Right. I, I saw him do the thumb. I saw him do the lip. I just ad libbed it one night at the comedy cellar in the village, and the place exploded, and I, I knew I had the hook. Right. For the so next the guy years. you're watching on TV is doing you doing Clinton. Yeah. And is that a tip of the cap, or is he stealing? No, I, I don't know. The problem is th- he's only doing those gestures. The problem is the guy's a really good impressionist, and, and we're both doing the same guy. Oh, I see. So it's not really stealing. It's just uh, I'm saying that was included, you know, in this person's set. But like when I had to do Regis, right after Dana did Regis, I couldn't do Regis, right? You know, it was like it was <laughs> Dana was so perfect, right? You know, so I finally decided that I would do a, I would do, I would do an ultra nasality. That was the one part of the voice that, I mean, Dana took it all, but there was this one thing at the top of your nose that uh, he didn't go that high, high. And I said, what if I go higher? What if I go way to the top of my schnoz up in here? And I go into, Joy and I were down in a cave until your water that was a thousand years old. It was a thousand years old. <laughs> See what I mean? Right. Yeah. Up high. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, listen, I'm glad we're talking about the uh, approach because, you know, I've never really talked about the technical side yeah. of, of what you do. Mm-hmm. I've just, so there's a couple things. I think people just think you can do voices or you can't do voices, which is part of it. You know, I think there's a, like, a, look, uh, someone who has a great singing voice, mm-hmm. it's kind of God given. But you also have to work at it like it's a craft, you know, or, right. or anybody, you know, it's like Michael Jordan's a great athlete, but you have to work at it real hard. Yeah, too. and I, I worked crazy hard. Yeah, I can tell. Hard yeah. <laughs> for a long time. Of course. And I, I never, so when you, you obviously, this is the kind of thing you start doing when you're seven years old, right? right. It just right. It just sort of is in you. Like right. I always talk about, I remember interviewing Tommy Lee, the drummer, at some point, and something that just always stuck with me. I said, like, well, you know, when did you get your first drum kit or whatever? And he said, when I was like five, I was just banging on pots mm. and pans. You know what I mean? And then so someone got him a drum kit, but I wasn't banging on pots and pans when, and most people weren't. But he, it was in him somewhere to do this, and it. Uh, voices are that way. So it's sort of a, what's interesting yeah. to me is like my mother could talk like other people. She, she could talk like the coaches and different people in church. She could talk like other people, and we would even listen to pa, uh, pa, Paul Schofield and Ralph Richardson doing a Christmas Carol and do little pieces of it. Mm-hmm. You know, I was seven, six or seven. 
But I mean, it, you know, just a ha ha, Merry Christmas, Uncle. <laughs> right. Hamburg. You know? Yeah, this is um, how that you guys was connected. So that was a way of connecting with her. I mean, you know, usually a very remote woman at best. Your mom. Mm-hmm. She was uh, depressed, the violent or something. Abusive. Yeah. abusive. She, I remember some of those stories. Yeah, she was pretty rough. Um, she, I don't know what, you know, you would say that the diagnosis was today. I mean, it would be somewhere between dissociative, um, ep- a dissociative disorder, you know, and uh, I don't know, somewhere in there. I don't know. Well, how much? And, and what is it? Um, um, what is it? A, a, uh, the syndrome. Asperger's. Munchausen. Yeah. Munchausen, oh, Munchausen by proxy. Oh, is it Munchausen by proxy? Very possible. Like taking you into the emergency room and trying to get some attention because of things that happened to their kid? Yeah. So was that... That that, would really make a lot of sense Was that a thing she did with you? Yeah. Would like say, my son is Fell on his candle bars, therefore he's bleeding internally. He fell... She wanted that sympathy. We got him this new bike... And they, you know, he wouldn't listen to me. And he went over the curb and came in the handlebars, and now he's got this, these internal injuries. And did you? And then she'd say, well, "We're taking you to the emergency room." Yeah, we the, on that that particular instance, we went to uh, the ER in Coco, Coco Beach or Coco, Florida. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we did, I was living in Melbourne, and Melbourne didn't, didn't have its own hospital yet. Did. Uh, now, were you saying, I feel fine? I just want to lay down? When what? When you get hit with that handlebars. You don't move. I mean, were you injured? Yeah, I was I mean, injured. it's not really Munchausen's by proxy I was if you're actually injured. By a hammer. Right. That's where the injury came from. Right. There's nothing to do with the handlebars. No, no. But I'm saying, if your kid is legitimately I've taken my kid to the emergency room a few times, but I don't have Munchausen's by proxy. That kid had a problem. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Right. So did your mom have this thing, or were you uh, actually injured? She No, she hit me with a hammer. Oh, she hit you. <laughs> Sorry for laughing. It's okay. Uh, so, and then took you in. Y- yes. So then she inflicted the wound. It's okay. I was telling this story to Taylor Schilling one time, was a friend of mine, and she started laughing. She's like, Daryl, it's just too, it's, it's, yeah. it's too much. It's the monsters, you know. It's So, so yeah, how much? Yeah, Munchausen's counts it, it's also, if it's falsified, but also if it's deliberately induced. By you. Yeah. It's not, but not if the kid falls off a skateboard well, down prox- the street. By proxy is if, Yeah. Yeah. No, I guess, but I, yeah, if he did it himself. But she said she he said she hit him with a hammer. So. I know. I was just on the handlebar oh, yeah, yeah. bike part thing. Okay. I was trying to figure that okay. part out because if you were injured, I would not want to throw your mom under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess we're going to do that. Yeah. So then here's the here's the question because I've had this with my own family, mom as well. Uh, now a lot of people go, look, th- this person needed help. Or yeah, had had yeah, had, yeah. An, had issues, yeah. and so on and so forth. Yeah, and uh, maybe it's easy for you t- and me to go. Well, she should have got her shit together, or yeah. whatever that thing is. But and, maybe they couldn't get their shit together. But then here's the part where I I have my mom didn't hit me with a hammer, but I got my own issues with my mom. But my feeling is sort of like once you, do you have kids. Not by myself biologically, but by when I was married. Let's see, not by yourself. So it's not it's not like mine a, biologically, a but oh, you have a step- my, my wife had a daughter with a, a previous relationship. Oh, so you have, we had a stepdaughter, have a stepdaughter of okay. sorts. Mm. Okay, <laughs> sorry, I'm not grilling you. I'm just trying to. That's okay. Trying to connect it's just, the dots. It's, just, it's hard to talk about, you know, some, you know, a daughter. Uh, publicly because, you know, it's her right to be present when that's happening or choose if it happens. Sure. But anyway. Well, we don't have to mention any names. I'm, I'm just okay. saying once you have kids, yeah. many of the things your parents did become unthinkable. 
Like you just, you would never do that. You would never do that to your kid. Like you could, you can hug them, you can screw around with them, you can tell them you're happy to see them. You, there's so many things. I I ended up having sort of less sympathy for my parents once I had kids because I re, I realized like for my family, almost everything was just blamed on money. We don't have any money. We can't have any money. We can't do anything. We don't have any money. But I was like, yeah, but you can hug your kid and tell them you love them. Or like go out in the yard and throw the ball around or something. Like it's, yeah. it's mainly effort. You don't have to burn calories being negative. Yeah, I mean, part of my therapy was understanding that, you know, the my parents did exactly as they were wired to do, you know? Right. M- modeling some minor version of behavior they'd seen growing up. You know what I mean? Like, that's that's the best way I can look at it. Right, mm-hmm. like that behavior doesn't. You know, there's always a, an antecedent to that. Yeah, I guess the question is sort of like, I think the common wisdom is, well, you you forgive them, so you can move on. I guess. Yeah, I mean, the forgiveness is for you, not for them. The forgiveness is um, so that you can um, understand. Like in my case, understand. Yeah, how this happened. Mm -hmm. understand that this monstrous behavior didn't come on this earth by itself, that it was created somewhere, and and all of that, that enables me to stop hating. Mm -hmm. It just helps me not hate anymore. All right. So that I can move on with my life. We're not talking about condoning behavior or even saying uh, you love this person. What percentage of people do you think who have parents like that? Because it, it really just goes in two directions. Either I'm going to do the exact opposite of what my parents did to me, or I'm going, or I do the exact same thing. I, I listen. I don't have a ton of sympathy for the argument of, well, that's how they grew up, or that's what was done to them. You know. Now, there's different levels of awareness, but what I'm sort of basically saying is is i grew up with parents that weren't fantastic and i just went well i'm not going to be that way because i know what it's like to be on the losing end of that so i will push harder and go the opposite direction with that it seems pretty doable it's very doable but on the other hand the daughter of the alcoholic dad always marries the alcoholic and you'd think, well, she had a front row seat to how horrible this disease is. Right. And why would you ever want to do that? But yet there's something woven into our DNA that makes her attracted to the guy who's the alcoholic. You know, to, to return to the scene of the crime right. where they were damaged to begin with. Right. And find a stand in for that person that they could never negotiate with. Or, right. Or a fact who couldn't affect their behavior on any level. I get it. And I, I think the key to life is kind of the gin rummy hand. It's it's kind of discard the gar- the cards that aren't working and get cards that are working. So if you can kind of say, here's uh, here's what my family of origin did. Um, uh-huh. Okay, I saw it, I evaluated it, and here's a few things they did that I liked. I'll, I'll keep these cards. You know my my. Family was never physical with their kids. They never laid a hand on their kids. And I'd go, okay, that's that's good. I don't want to lay my hands. On, I'll keep that part. But they didn't do a lot of hugging and a lot of propping up and a lot of that of boys and that kind of stuff, encouragement. So I'll go, all right, they didn't do that, but I'll 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 do that. And they weren't, uh, you know, they weren't verbally abusive. They didn't raise their voice very often. They didn't melt down or scream at their kids. I'll go, all right, that's. That's good. And they were generally sort of even handed. Like, you know, like if I said, oh, God, the guy down the street, I hate that kid. They'd go like, you don't know what he's going through. He may have some issues and you should really be sympathetic to that. You know, and I would go, all right, that that seems like a decent quality. They didn't litter. That's good. (laughs) Noted. But. I wanted a dog, and I never got a dog. So uh, I'll take these qualities they had, most, some you know, a lot of bad, but some good. I'll keep the good stuff. I'll discard the bad stuff, and I'll get my kid a dog. So you'll be creating a custom plan for yourself. Yes, yeah. yes. That's kind of how it worked. My first email address was rtc 
reverse the curse. Mm -hmm. I, that was my that was my my thing in life. That's what I wanted to do. I would I wanted to not be that. Yes. So, know? and it's interesting to me because, you know, on his deathbed, my final and my father's like final words, you know, among them were, uh, uh, "I was a good soldier, but I I my sin is I." I let my anger be more important to me than my children, and which was, you know, wonderful. I mean, it really helped me in a zillion ways. But then when I got older, um, time went by, and I was placed in uncomfortable situations, and I, I, lo and behold, my anger became the most important thing in the world to me, you know, not to the degree that it was with him, but it was really important. You know, the anger provided a lot of services. What do you mean important? Because it it, it made me feel um, self, not self-righteous, but almost. It was significant? Significant and um, give me a sense uh, it, it give, and, and, and clarity. Oh, my God. The clarity, you know, during a fit of rage, you know, that's addictive as well. But you know, people become 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 anger addicts. So, I I I'll use this word a phrase again. Minor version. I, I I on that level, I I was a minor version of that. You know, I wasn't in, in, in the abusive strain, mm -hmm. like my father would do things like punch holes in my doors. Right. I mean, stuff like that. I wasn't. I I, I never went to that. How would you show your anger? Get drunk. Disappear. Just just get drunk. You know. My rage and alcohol were kissing cousins. They were they were first cousins. They worked very well together, you know. This wounded, angry person, and then you have this this alcohol addiction that wants the booze and says, "Listen, I'll get the booze." Okay, that's going to give you the courage to find a stand-in for your mom. Okay, so when you get into this, and I would go through these relationships, and they were minor versions of my mom, you know. Yeah, it's, it's like Mother Nature has said this hasn't been worked out, okay? And this, we will never really stop working on this. Yeah, it's sad that that's our wiring. Yeah, it, be, it really is. It would be Just nice. Want to forget the whole damn thing. Well, I mean, it would be nice if our wiring was the girl who had the front row seat to the horrors of alcoholism, understood how evil it was, and avoided it at all costs and further relationships instead of being attracted to it. Now there is a number and it's maybe one in 10, but there are many people that have this gift of clarity where they go, I don't drink at all. Never did saw what it did to my dad. Never touched the stuff. A there, there is like one or two out of 10 people will go that route with yeah, it. But, but a slim percentage is provides, you know, hope. Yeah, I well, guess. Let's keep working on this stuff. Yeah. All right. We're going to take a break. We got the Rotten Tomatoes game. I also got, uh, I want to try some Bobby Hollander out on you. You don't know who that is, okay. but I'll see if you can. All right. See if you can summon him up. We'll do that right after this. Let me tell you about Turo Innovative. It's the world's largest car sharing marketplace with Turo. You can book any car you want, wherever you want, from a community of local hosts. Browse a huge selection of vehicles for just about any occasion or budget. Book an SUV or a minivan for a family road trip, a pickup truck for some errands, or even test drive an EV. Every trip is backed by liability insurance. Terms, conditions, and exclusions apply. Find your drive. Forget your boring rental cars at Turo, T-U-R-O dot com. I want to talk to you about my friends over at Lear Capital. They're a new partner here on the podcast and uh, someone, a group that I've been familiar with for a long time because I've been in L.A. for a long time and Lear Capital's been out here for a long time too. So I trust these guys. I feel comfortable speaking on their behalf. Lear's the leader in the precious metals business and provides a great way to give you and your family protection and diversification. I look at owning gold the same way I look at my car collection. Over time, gold and vintage cars can increase in value, but you can touch them 
they're they're tangible. It's not just n- numbers on a spreadsheet. Keep it in a safe place. It'll provide a bit of comfort knowing that you can hold it whenever you want. Gold to me is king, kind of like eh, like an old vintage Lambo. So reach out to Lear Capital at learadam.com, and they'll send you a free investment guide. They'll provide all the information you need to make up your own mind about having a little peace of mind in your hands. It's that easy. So go to www.learadam.com or give them a call, 800-489-6450. That's 800-489-6450. Lear Capital. Daryl Hammond in studio is going to beat the Hollywood Improv coming up August 16th with our favorite Jay Moore, both doing impressions and stand up. And so you can look forward to that. Um, the uh, There's a guy named Bobby Hollander. Uh-huh. Bobby Hollander is a porn producer, <laughs> director. Uh, director. He's not an actor. He's never been an actor, but he's he's a part of my childhood. He's from, uh, I shouldn't say childhood, uh, but I was aware, I became aware of this person when I was about 18 or 19. Okay. And, uh, well, I'll play, you the, I'll play you the tape. So sometimes, like, uh, Jay Moore came in here and did his Bobby Hollander, but his Al Pacino. <sighs> oh, okay. So I'll show you that, because I thought it'd be funny if you gave him a shot. Is maybe Al Gore or something yeah. like oh, that. I don't know if I can do that, but I'll. I'll he would I'll intro listen. his. Yeah. Or you can try Bobby Hollander, but we'll we take a look at it, just to, just for entertainment. Hi, you thought it was Alfred, but it's not. My name is Bobby Hollander, and I'd like to introduce you to a tape called "The Personal Touch." Now, the personal touch is something different in home entertainment. It's strictly a dope, it's strictly X, and it's hot. It's so hot, it's gonna blow your balls off. It's gonna wanna make you wet your panties. It's gonna wanna make you reach in and grab it. It's gonna wanna make you come right on your television screen. The personal touch means personal touch. It stars Shauna Grant, Sharon Mitchell, Paul Thomas, Ron Jeremy, Dominique, a newcomer to the screen, Gene Hollow. The personal touch was shot on videotape to give you the finest quality in adult entertainment. All right. It's going to let Any you... thoughts on Bobby Hollander? It was the phrase where he said something your balls off. Can blow your balls off? Yeah. <clears throat> so it's right, it's right around in here. Right? It's right around in there. You're going to blow your balls off. <laughs> There's a script there if you want to look at it. Where? I think it's to your right. Um, that small, the uh, the first sheet. That no, that other sheet. Sorry, that. Oh, we'll play play a little more, Bobby. Let's see. Just, see just that says, it's gonna make you want to but make you make you want to blow your balls off. There we go. Out of the bar, and you guys that are watching it in a bar, we're gonna be into the bathroom in a minute, pulling your wang wang. <laughs> I don't mean to say it in an obscene way, but we we wanted to make it that. Way. Shauna Grant in this film who stars you've seen in Penthouse, you've seen in Swank, High Society, Chic, Hustler, Velvet. You've jerked off to her in Genesis and Gallery. She's gorgeous. She's young, she's blonde, and she has a body that'll blow you away. She's going to tell you how you can write to her personally and get a free black and white personally autographed photo of her like a little, just by sending is there can, can you imagine this you wrapping your mind around this daryl yeah you know the interesting thing about his approach is he really really could be a great mafia capo mm-hmm. you know he's the really guy who the, the kind of guy is like you know when you uh when you uh when you tune somebody up <laughs> They wake up, they have a headache, whatever. But when you alter another, you fundamentally change them. Do you understand? I mean, am I yes. in the right direction? Yeah, yes. I, I could see him in The Sopranos now. Yeah. yeah. Go. You fundamentally change him. This means that, you know, from now on, he don't laugh all the way no more. 
Yeah, it's like intense but soft. Yeah. He has to get one of them craftmatic adjustable beds. <laughs> he, yeah, he has a. It's that sort of presentation. Yeah, go to blow. Go back to the beginning. I want to see if we can get the blow the balls off. So part. hot, it's going to make you blow your. Balls I once off. I once had a, a mafioso guy advise me on 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 the subject of re- revenge. You know, and it, it just re- it's that thing. You know, he was a guy that worked at, uh, he'd sell tickets at McHale's and mm-hmm. NYC. And uh, uh, I was getting drunk in the daytime, and I told him there was a guy in my apartment that was house that I had allowed to stay there who told me I had my head up my behind and that I was going to go back in a little while and hit him over the head with a lamp. <laughs> so he, he gives me the lowdown of like, uh, when you hit a, a person with a lamp. You know what happens next? You go to the penitentiary. Do you understand? <laughs> Does this resonate with you in the same way it resonates with me? That's why they call them wise guys. You go to the penitentiary. The weird part, most guys get drunk, hit some guy, they're jealous of him, hit him over the head. Next day, they bust the Rikers Island. And the weird part, they don't feel good about what they've done. <laughs> they feel bad. However, my line of work, people I know, there are people that don't bother at all. Don't mean nothing to them. Where's this guy right now? I'm like, he's in my apartment. He goes, give me the keys. I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> he comes back like a half an hour later. And I'm, gonna, I, I, I'm paraphrasing, right? Because I didn't record this. He comes back about a half an hour later, and he's got a golf club, and he goes, your friend is gone. <laughs> and I said, like, okay, what? now wait, wait. He goes, he left. I was like, How? Uh, why? I says to him, my friend, you're going to sleep somewhere else tonight. Oh, you're going to be sleeping at Kennedy Airport, trunk of a car, long-term parking. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he left. So that that's... Kennedy Airport long-term parking is something I would not have the ability to write. Right. right. Do you, right. you know what I mean? Yes. Or alter a, a person. Yes. Yes. But anyway, he does have that. And well, you want to great... hear him talk about blowing That's your terrifying. balls off sure. one more time? Sure. Let's hear one more time. It's strictly adult. It's strictly X. And it's hot. It's so hot, it's going to blow your balls off. It's going to want to make you right. wet. It's so hot, it's going to blow your balls off. <laughs> Do you understand? Does that resonate with you the way it resonates with me and Sharon Mitchell? <laughs> uh, you know, now think about this. What if you were this man's daughter, son or daughter, let's say daughter, and maybe grandchildren, and the only evidence you had of him being alive was, was this tape. Like, if you wanted <laughs> to see your grandfather, like, if someone said, like, what was grandfather Bobby Hollander like? This is it. This is all This is all they would have to watch. God, I don't know. Yeah, I think don't show them, right? Think of, think of your bulls. <laughs> Just for a second. Think of them sweating. Do you understand? Were you, uh, I remember when I ran into you backstage at Caroline's years ago Uh and they just launched the whole KFC campaign and Mm -hmm. and you were the colonel right right? Mm -hmm. and then they got into this uh, rotating colonel where essentially the, the, the announcement went out which is I want everybody you've ever heard of in Hollywood to play Colonel Sanders except for Adam Carolla (laughs) <laughs> I'm the only person that never phone never rang to play the colonel. But I always said, like, what was was that the initial idea or did you do it? Because you didn't seem happy with it. Like, you kind of seemed like you did it. And you didn't really want to do it anymore. No, no. It, it was a huge deal to me and a very important thing. And I was corresponding you know, with Colonel Sanders' family, and they were sending me memorabilia and notebooks, and it was really, really going to become a lifestyle. When I got a call from my agent, they had decided to um, replace me with 10 or 20 more actors. Why? Yeah. What What was the story? I thought you were just going to be Colonel Sanders for, you know, decades. I did, too. I was planning on it. And they didn't say, uh, I don't know, Deb, 
Daryl melted down on set. We don't want to work with him anymore. Or well, whatever an my whatever my lunacy and addictions have been, they really don't have not made it like onto the playing field. I mean, I've been really good about keeping that separate. Mm-hmm. Right. They, so it certainly wasn't a part of of when I was doing the Colonel. It so, had to have been a because there's a rotating chair. Like nobody kept that really kept that role. Like they just. They I mean, now and well, then, not that yeah, you just but, got a five dollar five dollar pickup. That's but all, Chris, all do. here's why you're semi retarded. <laughs> The first, the yeah, once, well, once you get to the fifth person, that fifth person knows it's a rotating chair, but it doesn't start off as a rotating chair. It starts off with Daryl Hammond oh, I, playing. I imagine that they, they thought, I didn't think that they, I thought they, by the time they changed it from Daryl to the next person, they thought, okay, let's just keep this moving. Like somebody maybe pitched that. That was ex- the way it was explained to me. Right. But they originally went, here's our Colonel Sanders, right? Yeah. I mean, I was about to go to Kentucky to meet them. I was about to go down there. So they didn't have the rotating chair from Jump Street. They no. had it after Daryl had become it. Right. So I want to know what the story was. Like, what, what, uh, and you never got the story. No. But you, they were all in on you. I mean, you're getting memorabilia from the family. You're going to go to Kentucky. And plus, blah, blah, you know, blah. they were selling a ton more chicken. Yeah, you know, their sales were way up. Uh, the reviews were really good, um, and they replaced me. That's not the first time that's happened to me. Uh, that was maybe the first time that happened to me. So it's weird. And and by, by the way, you never get the story. No, somebody something. I mean, sometimes it can be a wife or something. It goes this, this guy rubs me the wrong. I don't want this or something. But you never get the story. Yeah, and and you're you're, you're you know it's it smacks of villainy. You know. And yet, how, how does why, it smack of villainy? Like, is someone out to get me? Why would someone do something like that? How many spots did you do before that? Three, 60 seconds, and a bunch of radio. Uh huh. But I mean, these are creative decisions, corporate decisions. Uh, you know, it's, it's not a hanging offense. But Matt, like, and now, now you're driving down the street, you see a KFC every five minutes. KFC has a uh i'd be curious about their trajectory because kfc was going the direction of h salt fish and chips which is part of my childhood wasn't going to make it into my adulthood they Uh were they were heading down for a while and then had this big resurgence daryl came along daryl came along Pumped some blood into that company, <laughs> and they fucking kicked him to the curb. Yeah, villainy, I say. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> well, villainy. I, I you just, say. you know, it's sort of like when something's working like that. Why did you stop it? I don't know. And it's, and, and, and it's on a, a clear ascent. Yeah, you know. See, the number one, there. Most of Hollywood, when you hear celebrities talk about stuff, it's mostly a lie. But I'll tell you the two things that aren't lies. The two things that aren't lies is when celebrities go you know they go your show was canceled and then the celebrity goes i know i was just watching entertainment tonight and they said it was canceled. Yeah. that's how i found out it was canceled like yeah. that isn't a lie that's how you found and the answer to why you this or why they ended that or why they pulled the plug or why they replaced you or whatever it's not a lie when they go i have no idea yeah uh those are the two non-lies in hollywood everything else is a lie <laughs> <laughs> you know, when when they say the celebrity had, uh, you know, uh, uh, exhaustion, that means junkie, you know, or, or, or they were dehydrated, that that means drug problem or whatever. Mm-hmm. Everything is a lie the except spin, for those yeah. two. Those two. Nobody they, wins from that. Like, so. Yeah, they never they never fucking tell you. And yeah, I mean, I know when uh, uh, when you're dealing with the big people. Um, you're going to get four or five different versions, you know. Right. Like why would why did you know um, Daily Beast had just you know named me America's Trump, you know Wall Street Journal was calling me the comeback player of the year. I mean, and then it was taken from me, you know, and it's explained it in several different ways, you know, that it was a creative business decision too, but it had nothing to do with you. I mean, it wasn't your decision, is what I'm saying. What do you oh, think God, it no. was? I could, I didn't know what it was, you know. I mean, right. I just didn't know. Because, you know, I had been planning all summer for this big fall media blitz. 
Mm-hmm. You know, there was a town hall with CNN. There was a lot of big stuff planned. With so the colonel. For, yeah, colonel. No, Scott with team. Trump. Oh, with Trump. Sorry. I, I was on the colonel. Yeah. With the colonel thing, I was getting ready to go down south to, to spend time with the family. It was going to be a big deal. <laughs> spend wow. time with the family. Yeah. Which is the ultimate, like, you know, if the, if the family approves, then then you're good. Like, any... any biopic, anything like that, if the family approves, that's a huge deal, right? That's hard to get. So if they approved <sighs> Daryl as the colonel. Yeah. I, I'm doing a workshop in the fall in New York uh, f- um, for a new play about Everett Dirksen, the first Republican senator to support the civil rights movement, and the family has approved me, you know? Oh, right. S- Interesting. So, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I was going to send them an audio recording of me doing uh, their their granddad or but you know nope they just said that no nope, don't have to you're in you want to uh play the little rotten tomatoes game i don't know if uh sure. the rules were explained to you before the i get show. it a little, a little bit i you mean got it? I, i'm gonna guess what percentage yeah okay. it's self self-evident all right So as a master impressionist on Saturday Night Live, we've all enjoyed listening to the many voices of Daryl Hammond. So today, we're going to make use of some of his go-to celebrities for a Hammond impersonation-themed round of the Rotten Tomatoes game. All right. Up first, in 1960s Baltimore, a dance-loving teen wins a spot on a local variety show and becomes an overnight celebrity. Can she handle the pressure of fame and her eccentric mother as she tries to racially integrate the show? Starring Christopher Walken, Zac Efron, and John Travolta from 2007, Hairspray. Mm. So so do you want me to say what percentage now or then? Well, it, it, it wouldn't it, have changed it's too what's much. On, but... What's on Rotten Tomatoes, the website, today? As of now... We're, don't we write this stuff be about, down? Yeah. Be about Does nine, he have a pen? I'd say 97%. He has, yeah, he oh, he's got a pen? He has everything. Wait, are you trying we're, to like, catch me right now? No, like, I couldn't say on? where his pen is. He was covered by a piece of paper. And yes. All right, you got... Oh, don't let me see it. Now I saw it. All right, so we're going to write it down. All right, so now, here's the thing. Uh, who do you do? A Chris Walken? No. You don't. John Travolta. You do a John Travolta? No. Who the hell does a John Travolta and not a... Chris Walken. I thought everyone did a Chris Walken. Hmm. All right. Um, Jay does a great Chris Walken. Oh, he does. Yeah, he does. I don't even know what John... If you do what John Travolta is, like that Vinnie Barbarino version, or this uh, the adult version of him? Well, the Vinnie Barbarino is like, Mr. Carter. <laughs> right. You know? Mr. Carter. You know, that's Vinnie, but I guess that's obsolete now. Uh, but that's Vinnie. That's your... I guess. Okay. All right. Well, what I'm saying is, is we were talking about Jerry Lewis the other day, and there's like a young Jerry Lewis and an old Jerry Lewis. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. I don't know if there's an old John Travolta. I don't either. All right. All right. Let's uh, look. Critics love this shit. Yeah. Have you seen it? No. I've seen it. I thought it was pretty good. The music's good. It's right. Fun. So oh, I, I love it. I've I, seen it several times. I would say this will be one of those movies where the critics would have it even higher than the people. That would be my, that would be my guess on this one. It was a massive hit, and everyone was. I mean, John Travolta can really dance, man. man. All right, he's playing a woman. We're, are we locked in? Yeah, I'm locked in. Locked in. What do you got, Daryl? Ninety-seven. Oh, wow. That's is, super high. That is really high. I went 83. Okay. I still went fresh, but I went a really low fresh. I went 68%. Oh, you guys sold me on this thing. Well, the little hairspray is certified fresh. Oh. 
at 92%. Oh, Jeez, oh, yeah, the people have it at 84. All right. Well, 97. I thought people like would be like, oh, this, uh, this isn't as good as it was on stage. Oh, yeah. 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 All right. Except it was made so many years after the stage version, you know, people yeah. forgot. Are you are you a good singer because you're so technically pitch perfect? Uh, I mean, I, I did um, 25th Annual Putnam County, Spe- Putnam County Spelling Bee, which is a musical with Broadway singers, and I could talk scene a little bit. <clears throat> you know, I could be happy with you mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. If you could be happy with me. I'd be contented to live everywhere. Watch what I care. You know, I can do that. Mm. But these cats singing next to them, I would never really try to. (laughs) I would never try to. Those people on Broadway are sick. But they're trained in it. If you you trained in it, you probably could. Yeah. I mean, I was in there to do the comedy, and I did the comedy well. You know, that went well for me. Yeah. All right. Next one. Next up. After his father goes missing while pursuing the Holy Grail. An archaeology professor finds himself once again up against the Nazis to stop them from obtaining its power of eternal life. Starring Harrison Ford and, of course, Sean Connery delivering his famous line, We named the dog Indiana. From 1989, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. All right. This is the second one? Third one? Which one is this? Third Third one. All right. I think these are all beloved, right? I mean... Uh, but I it thought that the first one's gets. beloved. Uh, I think there was a drop off, and now they're kind of kind of back, I guess. But uh, all right, let's see. I still think it's beloved. You, lock, you guys locked in? No, I'm. I can't. I'm. I'm gonna try not to listen to you. <laughs> Although I should Nothing have in the change. last one because it was so damn high. All right, I. I, I don't. Okay, I got it. Daryl, what do you got? Uh, 94 and 88. Oh, you don't have to do both. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. So you got 94? Yeah. Well, seems too high, but that's what I said about the last one, and you were the closest. I went 62. I went 90. I think it's pretty high. Oh, really? Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade is certified fresh. At 84%. Mm. Yep. All right. And Love the people it. had it 94, so people really like this one. Yeah, I remember it being a big w- hit. Wasn't one a stinker, though? Or am I just, is that Star Wars? I think the one with Shia LaBeouf was oh, the worst right. one, the Crystal Skull, and even that was a higher score, I think. Oh, than, really? Than I recall. All right. The whole series, they just like it. Yeah. All right. You know, I, I don't know. I thought he was so good in that part. But audience was like, "Wait, we are. This guy's not gone yet." Yeah, right. You know, when he's gone, then I don't know. We didn't want to see, uh, you know, the pup. The, um, are you talking about Shia LaBeouf? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I thought he was great, but we got to. Yeah, we have yeah. more. We have more to squeeze out from Harrison. Yeah, he was great in the last one. Yeah, it's amazing. Daryl, do you do a Johnny Cash? Um. I could fake it if you could play uh, Walk the Line. Mm. Well, Walking <sighs> Phoenix tried. <laughs> In this movie starring we- Reese Witherspoon, Robert Patrick, and Joaquin Phoenix as Johnny Cash from 2005, Walk the Line. Mm. All right. This is beloved. Beloved. Yeah. Well received. Fabulous. Everyone loves Johnny Cash. So this, was a, this was an Oscar darling, wasn't it? I guess, yeah. Never saw it. I don't know why. There's something about this genre of film that just doesn't attract me. Well, it's, it's wonderful. If you like Johnny Cash, I don't. I and the interesting thing about it is he didn't even try to do an impression of him. He did a version of him. Mm. Yeah, Johnny Cash is sort of the country version of Bob Marley. Yeah, in that beloved cannot say a bad thing about him. But I would never just sit around and listen to Johnny Cash and or Bob Marley. But it's it's heresy. You if weren't you a Johnny just, Cash fan growing up? If you go, no, nah, I mean, I grew up in fucking North That's Hollywood. Saying, so you know, like you, well, there was no a... country scene or there was just no vibe. I mean, you know, everyone did an impersonation of Johnny Cash. Like, Hello, I'm Johnny Cash or whatever. Mm. Everyone did a stupid Johnny Cash thing. Sort of had the man in black thing. And he was all over the 
the TV all the time, but I had no interest in country. I recognize him as a talented person who I just never got into. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. I don't think it really reached here because I'm growing up for me too. I never. This is never... SoCal, so, uh, the San Fernando Valley. Right. There's just no country anything. It was all kind of Beach Boys, and then it gave way to like Ario Speedwagon or something. There just wasn't, <laughs> there was no country presence. Yeah. Uh, occasionally, there'd be a crossover that was a country hit that made it into the pop side of the radio, which should be like, I think Elvira. Was, Elvira, but before Elvira, which I hate, I hate that song. Um, before that, there was, hey, did you happen to see the most beautiful girl Who was that? in the Conway world? Twitty? I think it was Charlie Pride, maybe. And if you did, was she crying? And I just like it because it'd wake me up. I'd be falling asleep in the back of my mom's VW, and he'd go, and hey. And I'd look around like, hey, what's going on? I, I, I fell did in love with have... Buck Owens singing Monster's Holiday. And then he had another one called Tiger by the Tail, which I saw him do with Dean Martin. I, re- I liked Buck, those two songs. Charlie Rich. Charlie <laughs> Rich, not Charlie Pride. Charlie Rich did. Hey, did you have... And... That's like the beauty pageant song? Yeah, I, 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 I well, let's see. The beauty pageant song. Maybe it got incorporated into, into the pageant. The, the pageant song I'll figure out in a second. And then at some point... Paper Roses, which was a kind of country song, was a Marie Osmond song made it made it over to the pop channels. Paper Roses, Paper Roses, oh how real those roses seem to be. It was top 40 and I wasn't spinning anything. It was an automated station and I would come on um, between, you know, every 12 minutes and then I would do liners and stuff like that. You know, um, later I became uh, a character actor on a morning show, but at the beginning it was like embarrassing stuff like, mm, can't fight this feeling. Ario Speedwagon here at 11 minutes after with BJ 105 and wham, <laughs> BJ 105 and boy, Georgia culture club. <laughs> six. It was sick. All right. So what's Charlie <laughs> rich, right? Okay. Hey, you guys know that song? You got to know it. Daryl, you got to yeah, know it. Yeah, it was song. playing in my head the other day. Oh, it was? <laughs> Did you happen to see the most beautiful girl who walked out on me? Right. Tell her I'm sorry. Tell Do her I, I need my baby. My baby. Oh. Bye bye. That's a fucking tall order. Like, did you happen to see the most beautiful girl in the world? Now, first off, what if you're standing with your wife? <laughs> Can't answer. <laughs> like, yeah, I saw the bitch. She left. <laughs> not you, sweetheart. Uh-oh. The most beautiful girl in the world. You're not even, you even cracked the top <laughs> 10. So, yeah, I saw her. And then the instructions. If you listen to the song, he's just stopping a guy going, hey, did you happen to see? All right. Now, if I did, if I do see her, then he's instructing me to say, uh, tell her you're sorry. Tell her you need my baby. Oh, won't you tell her that I love her? That's going to be a weird conversation for me to have with a strange hey, I know woman. I've never met. <laughs> yeah, but you're hot. <laughs> By any chance, you're the most beautiful girl in the world? Wait, we'll hear it. Up this morning. All right, so we got to blow out with old lady. That never gets played anymore at all, but it, it did somehow make it onto like 93 KHJ or something. Song. Yeah, it, it made it. That song made it. There wasn't the San Fernando Valley. In the entire San Fernando Valley, there's not one comedy club when I grew up. Not they're not an entire, you know, 500 square mile patch with dense humanity. There was never a comedy club and there was no country station darn yeah it was rough we, right. we had wtai in melbourne when i was growing up so we we heard uh we heard plenty of country and then later it became soft rock but all right so we put a a wager in on walk the line i say in daryl yeah i mean i'm, I'm afraid now because i'm i've been going too high I went 93. I went 91. And I went 92. I think it's okay to go high. On okay. This one. 
Walk the Line is certified fresh at 82. Darn! Darn. I thought the critics would be into this. Yeah. Uh, Historical accuracy, maybe too long, I don't know. Next yeah. up, a no-nonsense cop must pose as a kindergarten teacher in order oh, to apprehend a major drug and order uh, uh, dealer as he battles both unruly children and dangerous criminals. 100%. Starring Penelope Ann Miller, Pamela Reed, and of course Arnold Schwarzenegger from 1990, Kindergarten Cop. Mm. I I I reject these movies. <laughs> I, I didn't even watch Twins until like four months ago. I, I, I I'm I'm still avoiding Twins right now. I haven't seen it either. They're just. Movies like where oh, there, there's a maybe another one where he got pregnant or something. Yeah. I'm just like I just I'm a conscientious objector to this. I don't know why. I've just decided you don't they're like not his funny. Comedic roles. Um, uh, I mean, like like in um, oh true god, lie. true, true lies. Lie. Yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of comedy infused with that, but he was an action star. But there's still some good comedy in there. Like that's that's where I like it with uh, Arnold. I thought he was he he was pretty funny in the final Terminator, when he was an old version of the Terminator. He was pretty good. Yeah, I like I like I, a self aware. Yeah, of. look, I I love Schwarzenegger movies. Don't yeah. get me wrong. I just the the, the weird sort of Ivan Reitman y sort of big comedy stuff. I just I just reject. Well, I mean, you know, an agent or two or three probably said. Hey, let's show you in a different light. See how that mm -hmm. plays. Yeah, I'm not even saying it's bad. I just decided, I just decided it wasn't for me. Okay. I was. It's like some food that someone is talking about. Yeah. Like, oh man, you'd really love Ethiopian food, and I'm like, yeah, I'm all right. But if someone tells you you're gonna love it, are you determined not to love it? No, no. I. It. it, it but it all depends on the source. The worst source. For comedy, movies, is younger chicks who saw the movie when they were 11 and think Ladybugs is the funniest movie ever. <laughs> and then you go, but when Ladybugs came out, you were 27. Yeah. And you go, this is junk. And they go, no, it's totally funny. That's the worst source because... They think it is a funny movie because they laughed their ass off yeah. when they were 11. And now they want you to watch it. And you're explaining it ain't funny. And they go, you haven't even seen it. I've seen it eight times. It's funny as shit. Don't, never trust that source. Okay. But if Daryl Hammond or Jay Moore says, hey, it's a really funny movie that they saw when they were 37, then go, yeah. I'll, what uh, was Lady I'll believe Bugs? you. It was Rodney Dangerfield playing a soccer coach. Yeah. And huh. it's not funny. Mm. <laughs> but if you saw it when you were 11, you thought it was really fucking funny. Yeah, even Rodney needs a script, right? Yeah. All right. Well, I saw this as a kindergartner, and this is my introduction to Arnold Schwarzenegger. This is your first Schwarzenegger movie? Uh, uh, yeah, I bet. I mean, I was probably my four or five years My first stand-up comedy joke was Rodney Dangerfield and Span. I, in fact, I did that for my SNL audition. Which was, and it's not good, but I love it. Uh, it's, it's like this. Time Magazine calls him one of the funniest men alive. He's Rodney Dangerfield, and now he's in Spanish. k Records presents Rodney Dangerfield in the Pano. I'll tell you, say a simpatico, conmigo. <laughs> That's great. Porque mi nombre es tan gorda, all right? <laughs> so funny. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's a great angle. Okay. Well, that makes me fucking laugh. Oh. If you got any more, I'll take it. What, a variety in Spanish? Yeah. We need the whole K-Tel uh, Yeah. <laughs> oh, let's see. Uh, uh, que durante el hicimos el amor? Let's see. Que durante el, durante el hicimos el amor? <laughs> During sex. Yo tengo pedido y direcciones, all right? <laughs> I have to ask directions. Manganas? Are you kidding? Manganas? Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> he's one of the funniest men alive. He's Rodney Dangerfield, and now he's in Spanish. Rodney Dangerfield, in Español. Available now at these fine stores. Walgreen will walk up until Friday. Day. It's Walgreen will walk up until Friday. <laughs> that okay. is so funny. All right, Kindergarten Cop. Kindergarten Cop. I don't think the critics like this one. Me neither. As, as a kindergartner, I would give this 100%, but now I believe it's probably very rotten. I'm going 23%. Oh my God! Hold on, I didn't even write my shit down. But that's but Schwarzenegger's 
charismatic. Yeah. yeah, but you're right. This could be this could be a single digit. I may be situation. confusing this with cop and a half. <laughs> think about it, but he's charismatic enough, you know, to to pull something like that off. You, I mean, you. I'm changing my thing. All right, I'm 31. What do you think, Daryl? 44. Mm-hmm. Kindergarten cop is rotten at 53. Wow, wow. that's just rotten. might as well be fresh. Yeah. And I'd eat that. the people have it at 52. And this is a weird one that the critics liked it just a little bit more than the people. This would be one of those things where I you'd think the critics would be 15 and the people be 65. But there is that scene in the movie where the little boy says men have a penis and, and girls oh, have a vagina. vagina. Mm. Maybe we're getting a lot of late one. Maybe it was higher uh-huh. last I, year. I think that's uh-huh. where I learned the word vagina. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I just remember the, the little kid going, what's a ferret? That's a fairy. <laughs> that is a fairy. <laughs> yeah, like, what is a fairy? That is a fairy. I always that my my whole thing with Schwarzenegger at the beginning was he was playing a third generation Chicago cop, you know, <laughs> and he'd say, <laughs> "You can do it." But he'd say in that 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 thick accent. My dad was a cop, and his dad before him was a cop, and they walked the beat in Chicago, and I'm like. You have to, you have to have a thing where you go, where like his partner goes. This isn't Strudeldorf anymore. We don't do things that right. way. I know you came here on a cop exchange program, but we got they don't they never addressed it. He was just a third generation Chicago cop, yeah, you know, Bears jersey, right? Right. Class. I'm like, you do have to say something, right? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, sure. All right. Let's see. Is this our last one? We have one more after this. Oh, this this is the last one, yes. A teenage boy who is obsessed with 1950s television has his world turned upside down when a mysterious TV repairman makes his dreams of a simpler time come true. Starring Tobey Maguire, Jeff Daniels, and Don Knotts from 1998, the movie is Pleasantville. This is a weird and interesting movie. Don Knotts. I I don't remember Don Knotts being in this. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't know what Don Knotts' role was. Um, he was the TV repairman. Oh, he was. Ah. You know, when Don Knotts was younger, <clears throat> you know, he had <clears throat> sorry, much more resonant version of himself. Like, but Andy, I didn't mean to shoot Aunt B. You know, was, you know what <laughs> I mean. Right. And then, then, then he got older, and it just became a raspier version. But Andy, I didn't mean to shoot. You know, I was watching the beginning. <laughs> so, <laughs> Can I get a, a napkin, please? It's so funny that yeah. people. Uh, People had a thing. Like, I was watching the beginning of Three's Company last night, and it was the one when Mr. Furley was in there. (sighs) And they were just, they'd go down to the Santa Monica Pier and film everyone just going around in the bumper cars and riding on the merry-go-round. And they cut to Don Knotts, and he's just hanging on to the pole with both hands, and his eyes are bulging out. Just He did like the... Like it's, that's the franchise. This, the franchise is you looking scared. And that that's a weird. It's it's kind of a weird conceit. You know what I mean? Like yeah, just, and it's harder. When, it's harder when you know they used to say about Jerry Lewis. You know when he got older, it, it didn't look right for, for an, an old guy out there busting up people's sets. Right. It just wasn't right. as effective. So I have something like that. All right. All right. Pleasantville. Good movie. Not yeah. not shown very much. Like most people no, don't doesn't get any replays. No, but it's like a kind of an interesting movie. Yeah, all the basketball players making the the shot. Yeah, I I don't remember. I saw it in New York with Danny Two Sheets. I I remember, but I don't remember much else uh, past that. But I did I, see it in the theater. I've probably seen it once. I don't remember disliking it. Yeah, I think I think they, I, I didn't see it and I wasn't aware of it. I think they mm. like it. It really. Fell through the cracks, and it never. It's not on any rotation Is it anywhere a good movie? else. Yeah, it's good, cool. and I think the critics liked it. All right, you in, Daryl? Yeah, I said seventy nine. I said seventy nine. Oh my god, I have sixty six. Pleasantville is certified fresh at eighty six point percent. The people have it at seventy nine. Yeah, interesting. That makes sense. All right. I don't think 
I don't think I'm going to get uh, a silver or gold in this one. I may be bronzing. I I'm bronzing it on this one is what I think. All right, here we go. Let's see if that is true. Congratulations to all of you. You have made the podium in this round of the Rotten Tomatoes oh, game. Yeah. Congratulations, guys. Chris Loxamana showing strong with a 77. Congratulations on third place. Ah. Oh. Leaving us Adam Carolla and Daryl Hammond. Daryl fighting hard from the beginning. Lost a little bit of ground at the end, but was it enough to beat perennial all-time champion Adam Carolla with a score of 71? Congratulations, Ace Man. Good enough for second place. Daryl Hammond wins with 53. Wow. Holy moly. I mean, holy moly. I shouldn't say anything, but after hearing about him. Daryl's childhood, I just kind of <laughs> tanked it. I tanked that one. I felt yeah, so bad got, for the man. Give you one. Yeah. I wanted him to get win. some small victory. All right, we'll take a break. We'll do a little bit of news, and we'll do that right after this. Let me tell you about Angie, homeowners. You know, it's a lot of work to own a home. Whether it's uh, everyday maintenance, repairs, or dream projects, it can be hard to even know where to start. All you need is Angie. Your home for everything home. Find a skilled local pro who will deliver quality and experience. Over 20 years of home service experience. Bring them your project online or with the Angie app. Answer a few questions and Angie handles the rest. Look, you're busy. You don't have time to do all this stuff. Let Angie handle it. Take care of just about any home project in just a few taps. Download the free Angie mobile app today or visit online. Visit Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I dot com. A-N-G-I dot com. That's Angie. Let them do all the heavy lifting. First, there's the Jordan Harbinger show. The Jordan Harbinger Show, a different kind of sponsor for this episode, The Jordan Harbinger Show. Well, if you're a fan of fascinating podcasts and interesting people, you should definitely check this one out. There's an episode for everyone, no matter what you're into. Jordan talks with Scott Adams about persuasion in a world where facts don't matter anymore. Man, is he right? Or you go inside the dark world of wildlife trafficking. You'll always find something useful to apply to your own life, like routine changes to boost productivity or slight mindset tweaks to change how you see the world. Jordan's a good guy. We've had him on uh, many times. I know the man well, and he's worth a listen. We enjoy the show, and we know you will, too. So you can search. The Jordan Harbinger Show, that is H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. All right, Daryl Hammond's hanging with us. Yeah. No, nah, I don't think my dad's been, ever been in the bed of a pickup truck. I I drove to Las Vegas in the bed of a pickup truck. So I've spent a lot of time in the beds of pickup trucks during the summer, by huh. the way, uh, with no camper shell and no bed liner. And not even the split window in the cab where I could stick my head in and oh, talk to the people relief. driving. Just sat in a bed of a pickup truck. On the metal? Yeah. To, I, 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 brought a, uh, I brought a blanket or like a sleeping bag or something yeah. to like sit on. Because I remember at some point I was pulling the sleeping bag out of the cover and the cover just shot out the back. Because we're going 80 <laughs> miles an hour and it caught like a windsock and it just boom. Just I was like, well, I'm never going to see that yeah, again. Goodbye. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. It was one of my. I think, I think, uh, Daryl, huh. I think this would, in, this would encapsulate the early part of my life. Okay. This just this one story alone. Okay. Okay. I think this covers it. If you were going to go, how was your life from zero to thirty? I would just tell this one story, and this story would go. I'd go take this story and just extrapolate it over an entire thirty-year period, and that would be my life. I we were going to Las Vegas. It was me, my buddy Chris, my buddy Ray, and they're big dudes. Everyone was a pretty big dude back then and we had one mini pickup truck an 84 nissan four five five speed uh bench seat no air 
You know, just black, no air, a standard bed, no headrest. And I ended up buying the car from this guy. But this was the nicest car out of the three of us. This would be the nicest car we had. This is what you want to take the road trip. This is a pickup truck that was only, at the time, was only like six years old or three years old or something. And I, Chris came and picked me up in my rented house, and I got in the front of the car, and then we sit in there, and this it's a mini pickup truck. People forget pickup trucks were miniature back in Japanese, you know, back in the mid eighties, right. early eighties. And then we went to go pick up my friend Ray, and we went in front of his apartment, and he came down. It was at night, and he walked up the car, and he looked at me, and he said, "Get out! I sit in the back." I said, "The bed of the truck." I said. Because there's not enough room for three big dudes in this pickup truck on this bench seat. And I said, uh, no. And he said, yeah. get out. Get in the back. That's just who this dude was. And I said, uh, look, this is who I am. I go, look, uh, we're going to Vegas, and then we're coming back in this pickup truck. There's no goddamn way you're riding in the front seat there and back. It's a five-hour drive. You're either going to go... There, or you're going to go back. You're trying to create a compromise. And I will let you... Work in compromise. You will decide on that. Now, this is like eight at night. It's the middle of summer. He goes, I'll take it now. I'll ride on the way back. And I thought, (laughs) okay, fine. Because when we come back, we're going to leave at noon. And you are going to melt in the back of this black... You may die in the back of this pickup truck coming home from Las Vegas. No split window, no camper shell, no air conditioning, no bed box, no bed liner, no nothing. And, you know, check out is noon at the hotel. So, I don't know. We're driving home. Everyone has to work on Monday. Like, we're we're driving home while the sun's going to be up. And you're probably not going to make it to Baker without dying in the back of this thing. So, I'm like, fine. Sit in the stupid back of this pickup truck for five hours. No head, no earbuds, no, no, just, just all the way to Las Vegas. Get to Las Vegas, lose a few, lose at gambling. Then when we're leaving on on Sunday, I'm like, look at my buddy Ray, and I go, it's payback time now, oh, bitch. Yeah. You're going to enjoy the back of this. And he goes, fuck that. I ran into a rich dude who I knew, and he bought me a plane ticket, so fuck off. <laughs> he flew back. <laughs> he flew back. That's it. That's my childhood. Yeah. That, right. that zero to 30, that, that's, you want to know how my life that's... was? I got out of the car. I was in the front. I got out and said, fine, I'll climb into the back. I climbed that's into the back. That's what they call a microcosm, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. That's all you need to know of how my life was. All right, what do we got, Max Pata? All right, so this, this writer strike is is getting, oh, yeah. uh, getting kind of crazy, and the, and the SAG after a strike as well. But So first off, L.A. Mag reported that Universal, there's a strike outside the picket line. Uh, they, they come out one morning, and temperatures north of 90 degrees, mm. and they had pruned the trees that were providing shade. I heard Universal said that this is a city permit thing, right. and they, they do said, it all yeah. the time and yeah. whatever. But what, but what everyone's saying, including like Arborists, they're even trying like, you don't do this in the middle of the summer. Man, when, when arborists are weighing yeah. in, the you arborists, know it's gotten out of hand. Yeah, so, yeah, and, <sighs> and so uh, uh, people are still going out there, they're picketing. But so it, this obviously got a lot of press over 90 degrees. And um, so they, they sent out, like the next day, Universal sent out pop up tents to provide shade. Mm-hmm. But I guess there are still like reports showing that Universal hired, these, hired the. The tree trimmers. So well, I think the microcosm there for me is that I mean it, I've had a couple of meals at Swingers in, in, in Hollywood this week and lots of writers there. <clears throat> and, and the one story that Swingers they, by the on ramp. The Swingers by on oh, Beverly. On Beverly, sorry, yeah. the breakfast joint. Yeah. yeah. So the one thing that everyone kept talking about was this idea that they would um, <clears throat> replace working extras with a, a likeness of themselves. Yeah. So that's what SAG's upset about. And they would never be able to earn it. <laughs> working right. extras so, how does that work so this is what happened so they the, the this is why sag afros now striking this is part of the a, their ai argument is supposedly there was uh, in the contract that said that if you're an extra if you're in a movie you would get your face scanned mm-hmm. and they would have your likeness to to use in all perpetuity in the future if, mm. but is that just the one studio well well that well, the, the SAG uh, SAG is saying that they said it doesn't matter. They can use it as much as they want. But the studios are saying no. 
we can only use it for this particular movie. And if we want to go beyond that, we would let you know and uh, we would compensate you for that. Yeah, you know, I, I hear about, I was watching Entertainment Tonight or something and the celebrities go, we do this role, uh, this is us. And then it goes into syndication and we get a residual check for 81 cents, you know, uh-huh. kind of thing. And uh-huh. then there's a part of me that's always like, well, I hate actors in general, and I hate uh, I hate unions in general. But there's a part of me that goes, "Yeah, that's some bullshit." And then I realize I used to build houses for a living. I never got a fucking residual check when they sold the house for three times what they paid for it, you know. Mm-hmm. And if you worked at a restaurant or you worked as a lawyer, like, a, or you're a dentist, you know, you, there is no residuals in any form of life it's, it's sort of like when i hear about uh you ever talk to a fireman go you want to get pissed off go find like a 48 and a half year old fireman and you start talking to him you're like what are you up to and they're like well i got about another year and a half and then i'm gonna retire and you're like you're younger than i am what do you mean you're gonna retire i've, I've been in for 25 years i'm gonna retire and there's a part of me that goes yeah that makes sense He's, and then there's another part of me that goes what the fuck you get to retire at age 50, you get to never work again for full pay and benefits. Like, I don't have that set up in, in my world. I don't I don't know anyone else who has that that set up as well. So right. I'm, I'm, like, I'm sort of mixed. On one hand, it's a residual. And there's like, if I write a book and the book keeps selling, you know, years after I wrote it, then you would get a residual check. Like, I'm, I'm kind of in on it, but... But isn't that what makes these jobs desirable, though? So, like, you want to be a fireman, so you get that. But yes. then if you find out mid-career, oh, we're taking that away from you. Yeah. In general, the thing about actors is it's a really low percentage job, you know? So it's like when people go, what are these people supposed to do? They got to put bread on the table for their family. Like, they have to get a real fucking job. Mm. That's that's what they have to do. It's a low like percentage what, gig. Uh, what percentage of actors are employed? Oh, I mean, it's like there's 200,000 SAG members and there's 8,000 people who work or something. 65,000 were picketing last week. 65,000? Yeah. But how many people were working? Right. That's the thing. And like, if you're, even if you're including just small parts or extras, I mean, I think the average, uh, the average pay is $27 an hour Mm -hmm. for these actors. For what? For the, for Indiana Jones. Yeah, <laughs> you, mean, you, mean for a, you mean for an extra job? Yeah. Extra jobs, yeah. Oh, that, small parts. I, I'm telling you, the, the greatest job I ever had was stand in <clears throat> on a on a movie. I got a I had a buddy who was an AD on a movie and he got me a stand in job and I was like, Oh my god, this is the greatest. I was got like a hundred and twenty dollars a day and all the granola bars I could eat and I was hanging around half the time. <laughs> I to me in my world. That was the greatest gig ever. Greatest the thing that I keep thinking is I, I really wish I could hear the dialogue in the room when the, there are people saying, you know what? Let's take that buck 25 away from them. Right. Let's well, take, let's take it away. So, yeah, so the residuals are upset because of the streaming services because they're not getting paid per view. They're getting paid for how much the streaming service paid for that show, right? So that's they're only getting like right. a single check. But as, as far as like what people are saying in the room, there was an unnamed executive – that told, I think, like The Hollywood Reporter, this is the quote for the writer's strike, the end game is to allow things to drag on until union members start losing their apartments and losing their houses. Wow. Yeah. That's, so That's their nuclear weapon. Right. So Ron Perlman heard that. Uh-oh. And he went on social media and he- Ron had, Perlman is feisty as shit. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> 85% of actors are unemployed at any given time only- 13% earn more than $10,000 a year. So, so I'm kind of saying, everyone, it's it's a low percentage gig. Right. It's it's definitely a hobby. So, mm-hmm. um, I mean, that was my biggest argument. Initially, I got in a lot of trouble years ago, like 20 years ago, when the extras were going on. The, there was a, I don't know, it was like 23. It was like 1999 or something like that. And the commercial actors went on strike and people would say, these people work, they may work twice a year, maybe two, maybe three times a year. They got to support a family. I'm like, they have to get a fucking job. What, what, what do you think roofers get to go? I choose to work 
You pick the three days out of the year. Like, uh, what, garbage men, roofers, guys who work at the fucking liquor store. Like, who announces I work three days a week? <laughs> yeah, so, don't, don't, so imagine that. that close to the vest, you're talking guys. to a fucking blue collar dude here. So it'd be me going, look, I only work as a roofer three days a week, uh, three days a year. So if I work as a roofer three days a year, I'm going to need $27,000 a day to work on your roof because I I just worked three out of the year. And I was like, you need to get a fucking job. And then everyone turned on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everyone got angry at me. But I was like, you have to get a fucking job. All right. Or be super good at commercial acting and be in every commercial. But uh, not real sympathetic to the only work three days a year. When I first uh, came out here, there was a famous person that told me, that even on its best day, show business is a game of chance. Mm-hmm. You know? And if you get good at playing poker, it's a game of chance. You will score. All right. We got Ron Perlman. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Let's watch some Ron. Uh-oh. Listen to me, motherfucker. He's angry. There's a lot of ways to lose your house. Some of it is financial. Some of it is karma. And some of it is just figuring out who the fuck said that. And we know who said that. And where he fucking lives. There's a lot of ways to lose your house. You wish that on people. You wish that families starve while you're making 27 fucking million dollars a year for creating nothing. Be careful, motherfucker. Be really careful. He sounds a little like Bobby Hollander and the mob... <laughs> The mob enforcer, Daryl. Yeah, long-term parking. It's a sort of a combo <laughs> between the mob enforcer wow, that and was Bobby really Hollander. Intense. That, was that was really intense. intense. Yeah. Wow. Is that protected speech? I, I think he needs to pick a better backdrop than sunshine and picket <laughs> fence and birds chirping. I, that's more, you got to find some cinder block. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, go down to the oh, basement. Uh, I need some cinder block. I just don't need this uh, Hills Are Alive with the Sound of Music motif in right. front of this speech, although maybe it's more sinister with that in the background. I'd say, Ron, you got to go down to the basement. You got to find some cinder block. We need a pipe dripping somewhere. The drip move. He doesn't have writers. What is he supposed to do? Don't shoot it in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> go find a block wall with some like graffiti on it. You know, and put like a leather jacket on. Like, you know, when, remember in the 80s, they do albums like rock albums, tough guy. Mm -hmm. And there'd be like four guys all standing there just looking <laughs> tough. You know crazy. what I mean? They'd have birds and picket fences and a well manicured lawn. They had, had graffiti and cinder block. And I think it's more sinister. This way. Yeah. Versus my dirt alley kind of way, right? Because I I, hmm. I believe it more in this in this environment and it, and just the the contrast. But but also the, he had like his his wife was like yelling something in the back. <laughs> we hear that again because at some point his mom or his wife was like yelling, you know, dinner's ready. Or like Ron, <laughs> Ron, come on, come in. Uh, Ron, the the trampoline's broke and the kids would need. All right, let's hear it. Listen to me, motherfucker. <laughs> a lot of ways to lose Who your yells? Some Somebody of it is yelled. financial, some of it is karma, and some of it is just figuring out who the fuck said that, and we know who said that, and where he fucking lives. Birds chirping. There's a <laughs> lot of ways to lose your are over. Get back I, in here. You wish that on people. You frittatas, come out of the toaster oven, Ron. Twenty-seven <laughs> come on. million dollars a year for creating nothing. Be careful, motherfucker. Be really careful. <clears throat> I'm. Sc it's scary to me. Scary to you? I was a little scared. I'd like. Now, what do you think? Cinder block without the old lady yelling about uh, brunch. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you? This may be Run your mimosas going flat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back into the house. You want dessert? <laughs> I think both are effective. I just think that uh, that might be sugar on your ice cream. Mm, you you mean it's too much. Maybe, We're gilding the lily. Maybe because he's already like scary. So what you're saying is there's two kinds of horror in horror movies. There is the sort of demon, and then 
there's the little girl with the la 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 la, and it's like it's a little girl that's school, but it freaks you out. She's walking down the street, la la. La, la yeah 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 la, 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 like amityville horror right right so you're saying this is the schoolgirl version of it not the demon I don't know, it right pretty, pretty, who it's is like, that it, his it, wife yelling for him can't I, a guy I, I, cut clear. a fucking backyard video and fucking peace woman <laughs> you know what i mean he's gonna fucking yell at her too yeah. when he goes back in like they call me one take ron and your shrew ass is yelling out on the that. porch i tell you to go out here and cut a a, 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 a threatening video. <laughs> All right, but I'm let's trying take to strong arm someone, okay? Take it to its furthest extreme. What if he was like in a pool floating on like a giant inflatable <laughs> piece, of, pi- too piece of pizza? <laughs> or would it be more sinister? I mean, I'm going along with your, you your argument. I, look, I, it's like uh, in, in Clockwork Orange, the singing mm-hmm. in the rain scene, he's singing that happy song while doing something extremely vile. So it's just, yeah, that contrast, I think, enhances it. But yeah, the pool floaty with, Too a, much. with a lemonade Too in much. his hand. All right, well, one more I, time. I just want to hear, and and at some point, not today, we got to mash that up with Bobby Hollander because I, I think they're almost the same dude. Let's see if the woman yells. Listen to me, motherfucker. There's a lot of ways to lose your house. Some of it is financial, some of it is karma, and some of it is just figuring out who the fuck said that, and we know who said that, and where he fucking lives. There's a lot Ron, of you opened a fresca and you haven't even taken a sip out of it, and it's been on the camp, it's been on the island for an hour. Are you coming in here or not? All right, now. What kind of sherbet do you want? <laughs> so I got Neapolitan and I got orange. Sounded like she said something's here. Ron, something's here. Oh, you got to recut the video. You, you, you can't have the old lady yelling from the house. Yeah. All right. But, but other than, you know, effective. Now, you could, <laughs> if you wanted to use her properly, you'd have her back like going, uh, um, Ron, I found your machete. It was in the garage. That would <laughs> oh, that would set it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think but so. But just a random yeah. yelling from the yard, not going to do Or screams it. of he- for help or something in the back. Yeah. Ron, I found out the meaning of blood spatter velocity. <laughs> <laughs> Can we talk? All right, let's bring it home. All right. Uh, let's see. Now. Uh, I am going to uh, play you a clip which uh, I much enjoyed from uh, Newsweek. Um, it was a three-year, coming up on the three-year anniversary of my uh, Newsweek tearing me a new asshole. and uh, A Newsweek I, article, yeah. News, Newsweek article tearing me a new asshole. And uh, I went over it with uh, Dr. Drew and we were doing our show together. And I enjoyed it. And I thought, well, I'll share it with the folks on uh, ACS. So, we'll take a break. We'll come back and we'll do that right after this. Let me tell you about Turo Innovative. It's the world's largest car sharing marketplace with Turo. You can book any car you want, wherever you want, from a community of local hosts. Browse a huge selection of vehicles for just about any occasion or budget. Book an SUV or a minivan for a family road trip. A pickup truck for some errands, or even test drive an EV. Every trip is backed by liability insurance. Terms, conditions, and exclusions apply. Find your drive. Forget your boring rental cars at Turo, T-U-R-O dot com. I brought my uh, my phone in the mm. studio, Drew, Whoa. which I never do. Because I wanted to break down this uh, game film for a while. I like to go back and look at these things. And this was the uh, Newsweek article about me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And and my Fine. and what I said about COVID. Yeah, your insane, insane rantings. All right. So next time Newsweek comes out with an article about anything and you're reading it. Think about this. I want you to think about this. Yes. Yes. Because this is. Please from- do, don't have Gelman amnesia. This is from the very beginning of September 2020. Mm. So this is 
2020. That's when this article came out. And it was uh, by, I'm trying to think how to pronounce this name, Ayla Slisko. Huh. A-I-L-A. Is that a name? How would you say that? Yeah. Ayla? Alia? Alia? Slisko. It's, it's not a Leah. It's A I L. We're looking at. I think we think it's Ayla. Ayla Slisko. Slisko. It's Slisko. Yeah, Slisko. L S C. I found her. S C L I S C O. Right. So yeah. here's the here's the thing that I found about this article. So I like to go back and look at it once a year. From all right. So this is three years old. All right. We're yeah. right in the middle of. Uh, COVID. I mean, we're just getting, we're really hitting our stride in terms of, now the reason they wrote this article is not because of my accurate COVID thoughts, but I'd outed myself to them as a, as a MAGA. Yeah. That that's why they write these articles. Otherwise it's just a comedian with thoughts Hmm. that happen to be correct. Hmm. Okay. So it says, uh, so a couple things you really have to think about. Radio host Adam Carolla was blasted on Twitter after falsely suggesting only the old and sick die of COVID. All right. So let's break down that sentence. Radio show host. Right. I haven't hosted a radio show in over a decade at this this point. Yeah. Yeah. Over 10 years, I've not been the host of a radio show. So why didn't they use the more accurate term podcaster? This is ostensibly a younger person who wrote this article. I'm assuming podcasting's all the rage and ubiquitous. Why not call me a podcaster, which is what I am and not a radio show host? Because talk radio. Talk radio is Republican. Talk radio is right wing. So yeah. you would describe me as a radio show. You sure as fuck wouldn't describe me as a comedian. Because right. comedians get to say what they want. Right. And they're not right wing. Right. So she could have described me as a podcast host, but that wouldn't fit as well. Because we're, we're shaping something here. And we're doing yeah. it in bits and pieces, right? Yeah, well, of course. So she could have called me a podcast host, but she didn't. And she could have called me a comedian but she didn't. Hmm. I am currently and was currently a comedian and a podcast host. Hmm. I've not been a radio show host for over a decade, Yeah, but yet that was my title. Yes. All right. Interesting. Yes. Uh, I was blasted on Twitter after falsely suggesting, and by the way, that's, that's unnecessary in this discussion because the discussion is what did I do? And what yeah. I did is I suggested only old and sick dive COVID. You don't but have you to put to. falsely right. in front of it. You, right. you're, you can just say what I said. Right. She doesn't have to have her opinion imprinted on the reporting. Right. Um, also, they will use the word only in this article multiple times. I never said only my quote was turns out the people dying from COVID are old or sick or both. How many of you pussies got played and who's getting played the next time? Yeah. Um, I now obviously saying prostate cancer kills old people is an accurate statement, but it's not you saying there's not a 27 year old male who didn't die of prostate cancer. Correct. Right. You don't obviously not only old people and sick people are dying. It is now just the overwhelming majority to a a point where it's statistically almost impossible to find a 10 year old boy without preexisting conditions who died of COVID. But I wouldn't say only, I would never say only because what you're not making your point right. that way. Of course, people have died of COVID that have been not elderly and didn't have pre-existing, pre-existing conditions. But anyway, that's, uh, so 
It's all in the wording. Uh, while insulting, and here's the other part I do like, so I'll read the whole thing. Radio show host, not a radio show, blasted on host, blasted on Twitter for falsely suggesting only the old and the sick die. Those are both inaccurate uh, of COVID-19 while insulting those who got played by believing medical experts. Uh. Hysterical. Believing medical. That's that's so manipulative. Yes. Got, and suggesting those who got played by believing medical experts. That was their whole fucking argument. Hey, so, bitch, who turned out to be right about this three years ago? Right. You or I. You were the good folks at Newsweek. Come on the show and defend it. How about that? We, we got to get her on the show. For She'll sure. never do it. Turns out, all right, so you got my, you, you got my, um, my quote, uh, although, the article continues, although the sick and the elderly are more susceptible to Ooh, serious what? complications or what? death what? due to COVID-19, isn't that what I said? Yes. <laughs> uh, they are far from the only groups that the virus kills. Far? Far. Far. Although the sick and the elderly are more susceptible, they're far from the other group. Yeah. Is that a lie? How false well, is that, that statement that's three years on? That's part of the insanity of this whole situation. Back then, they would use these hyperbolic terms. And, you know, it, if it was a 3% difference, they'd say, oh, nowhere near. Or if it was a 90% difference, they'd go, well, there's nothing to see here. Still, people would die. If one's not safe, we're all not safe. Yeah. So... Although the sick and the elderly are more susceptible to serious complications or death to COVID, through COVID, they're far from the only groups that the virus kills. Uh, no, I would say that's about the only group the virus kills. Yeah. Yeah. Statistically. Yeah. Data from the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, indicate that over 35,000 out of the more than 170,000 U.S. COVID deaths were in those aged under 65. Well, remember, mm -hmm. I said old and sick. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I had two groups. You cherry picked one of them yes. and gave a number. Uh, I, I'm dubious about 35,000 out of uh, the 170 COVID well, let's, deaths let's were remember. under 65. But they had pre-existing conditions. Not only that, there's a guy named John Baldwin right now who's going around and analyzing that data. And that group in particular, highly suspect in terms of actually dying of something COVID related. Yes. All right. So the article continues. Um, now, Drew, you're going to find all this uh, interesting. Um Although okay. the sick and the elderly, blah, 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 35,000. But they're ch they're picking old people now. And I said yeah. old and sick. In yeah. addition to many of those who survive bouts with COVID may suffer from potentially long-term damage caused by the virus, regardless of their age or previous medical history. So someone yeah, who's young and healthy got yeah. COVID and has suffered long-term damage. Well remember we had to listen to that <clears throat> pediatrician talk about end organ damage and destruction remember that mm -hmm. ridiculous that was ridiculous but the very people like this Salisco lady who uh were touting the incidence of long covid have now become skeptics that it even exists yes they flitched they've just flipped teams on that one yes so what part of this article is accurate so far? So in addition to many of those who survive bouts of COVID-19, they may suffer from potentially long-term damage caused by the virus, regardless of their age or previous medical history. All right, that's all bullshit. Many mm -hmm. who overcome the illness are left, are left with damage to organs, including the heart and lungs, along with other issues like persistent neurological systems. All right, this is all bullshit. This entire <laughs> article is inaccurate. It's in Newsweek. Yeah. These are the people that are constantly talking about f fake news and false information and uh, Dr. So-and-so has got to be taken off of Twitter because he's spreading false and inaccurate and dangerous statements. This is Newsweek. Everything they've said has been wrong 
thus far. Yeah. Now we shall continue. Corolla 56 may have been referring to apparently deliberate misinterpretations of the CDC data, which have been recently shared online by those seemingly seeking to minimize the serious health impacts of the pandemic. There was a tw- 10 qualifiers in that sentence. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. All right. But here's where it really gets good. Uh, no, I wasn't misinterpreting CDC data. I was looking around at my son and his friends and my daughter and their friends. I live in a community. It's pretty tight. If some kid bought the farm because of COVID, we would hear about it. Yep. I didn't hear any of it. I didn't see any of it. Now, here's the interesting one, Drew. There's a picture of me. And it's a picture from a movie premiere. Adam Carolla attends the premiere of the film No Safe Spaces. (laughs) (laughs) I've done a lot of movie premieres. There's lots of pictures of me floating around the Internet. But you pick the one that has no safe spaces and a step and repeat behind me. Yeah. Signaling that I'm making a movie with conservative talk show host Dennis Prager in a conservative movie about MAGA, free speech. Right. Extreme MAGA. Right. Ultra MAGA. So I'm a radio show host and I'm known for this movie that I never talk about. I did once. <laughs> right. Okay. Mm. All right. Um, let's see. All right. See, now, Drew, I'm getting emails. Um, okay. President Donald Trump on Sunday shared a tweet from an adherent, uh, sorry, an an adherent of the QAnon conspiracy theory, absurdly claiming that only 6% of CDC's deaths attributed to COVID-19 counted because the virus needed to be listed on the death certificates as the sole cause of death and otherwise <clears throat> as in otherwise healthy people. All right. So now here's the Donald Trump part. Here's, yeah. here's I, I, Trump. Ooh, you're ultra MAGA. You got to bring that out. But by the way, that is turning out to be pretty accurate. Yes. Well, of course, if you want to know what's right, you just read this Newsweek article and then just <laughs> the opposite of everything is right. Now you're doing an article on me oh and, and sending a tweet out where now, now it's a long paragraph on Trump in the middle of this, right? So you don't, remember we are talking about it's only political? COVID yes. is only political. This yeah. whole article is just a political ar- article, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Death certificates often list multiple causes of death despite one cause being chiefly to blame. In the case of COVID-19, some death certificates list underlying conditions as contributing factors which can include common conditions such as obesity or high blood pressure. Complications that result from contracting the virus are also sometimes listed as causes, such as organ failure leading directly to death. Yeah, or or not related to the COVID. Right. So that is the most convoluted, wild sentence. Yes. Although Corolla has made similar claims in recent weeks, while repeatedly insulting those who express concern about the pandemic as cowards that are hiding under (laughs) their bed. Well, that's accurate. (sighs) Monday's tweet had inspired substantial backlash by the next day, including from several prominent figures in the entertainment industry. Oh yeah. Well, they should have an opinion about medical I mean, misinformation because would you, you know, would you like to hear who the prominent Ooh. would you like to hear who the prominent figures are? I can't wait. Celebrities criticize Corolla's tweet for both the grammatically incorrect insult. I spelled pussies with a Y and <laughs> and the dubious medical claims. All I said right. old people and sick people got killed by COVID. Yeah. And the rest of you pussies got played. That's the most accurate 17 words that could ever be comp- com- composed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. True. Um, 
with many pointing out that younger people with no underlying conditions had died from COVID. Many, many younger people with no underlying conditions died of COVID, so says the prominent celebrities. Except for they didn't. I don't know where they got that information. Uh, Now, would you like to hear a prominent celebrity? I love it. I'm 60 uh, and have asthma. Actress (laughs) Valerie Bertinelli tweeted, (laughs) thanks for thinking it's okay that I die. Well, first off, would you think of, if I gave you 250,000 guesses, I just said, uh, here's here's a notepad with 500 pages blank. Here's five pens. I want you to write down the names of prominent celebrities. <laughs> Would you get to Valerie Bertinelli? I don't think so. But by the way, her fatality rate, even with moderate to severe COVID, is about 1% at the age of 60. Yeah. Um, but that's where the narcissism kicks in. Thanks yeah, for thinking right. it's okay that I die. Right. Okay. Right. right. You I, want me to die. I could have yeah. no no effect over Valerie Bertinelli. Right. All right. Uh, then, uh, oh, God, there's some over here. Oh, um, Corona Karma is real, Adam. Star Trek actor George Takei added. <laughs> <laughs> and you just tempted it to grab you by your pussy ass. <laughs> George Takei is the angriest man, 91 year old on the planet. Yeah. Which is funny. And also, he was in a short-lived series from the fucking 60s. He's <laughs> never done anything else. It's so comical. <sighs> All right. But you said prominent celebrities, and then you dug up Valerie Bertinelli and George Takei. Mm, I don't I don't call those prominent celebrities. Uh, there's, uh, there's a little bit more, Drew. Satirical news outlet, The Onion, also quickly shared a previously written article headline, Parasite Regrets Choosing Adam Carolla as Host, which is, I remember is an old article, but I can't even remember what, what inspired it. Uh, but there was one other comedian I'd, I'd never heard of uh, as well. Oh, so one last one. Um Comedian Dan Telfer joked that the president had just named Adam Carolla the Secretary of Health and Human Services. So again, back to president, you know, try to connect yeah. it to Trump. Number one. Number two, have you heard of comedian Dan Telfer? Never. So Never. you said several prominent Hollywood celebrities have weighed in. And then right under it, you mention a comedian who I've never heard of. Right. And I'm not saying that to be a slight. He may be a great comedian. I just have never heard of who Dan Telfer is. All right. Weird. Yes. Well, it's funny because uh, when they, when they, Obviously, this person can't write. You can't say several prominent whatever and then mention start your list with Valerie Bertinelli. You start your list with a comedian no one's heard of and then go to Valerie Bertinelli from one day at a time, 1977, everybody. Like, all right. So, uh, Ayla Slisko is an idiot and probably should apologize to me. Well, interesting, right? Also, what was the purpose of this article? Really, what was the purpose of it? Well, probably somebody, an editor in Newsweek, put her up to it, right? Yeah, just to, to just to make fun of and me. By the way, it might be, might might not have been so convoluted when she originally wrote it. It might be the editors at Newsweek that really took it all the way to where to its present state. But in terms of their their readership, what was it? Is it wow. is it to inform them, or, or is it just to make fun of me and kind of? It's basically, I told you, Drew, all political. I'm now perceived as a Republican, and I must be smacked around. Yeah. That's what this is. That's all it was. Yeah. It was a, well, including, including tweets from Trump in it. Which right. Is a right. 
So right. now what I told you the other day that it was this was all political. Yeah. You did. Look no this article is from the very beginning of September 2020. Yeah. And they had an election to win. Yeah. And that's where we were. Yeah. It's really breathtaking when you think about it. Interesting, right? I, I don't know about interesting. I, I, I guess interesting in the sense that it it highlights it, but it it, it gives me the creeps when you really dismantle it like that. It's, it's very disturbing. Yeah. Was there any part of that article that was inaccurate? I mean, in terms of what I said, were they just yeah. wrong? They were just wrong about every single point. Yeah. Right. Daryl Hammond's going to be at the Hollywood Improv. That'll be August 16th with Jay Moore. I'm going to be in Portland, Oregon at uh, Helium. That'll be this Friday and, and Saturday. And D.D. Hirsch has a 988 number. It's the Suicide Prevention Center. I'm doing some volunteer work for them. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, just 988. That's all you got to dial. That's all you got to dial if for you're help. feeling that way. Yeah. All right. Go to amcrow.com for all the live shows and check out uh, Daryl's Twitter and Instagram at Daryl C. Hammond as well. And until next time, this is Adam Carolla for Daryl Hammond and Chris Maxipata saying mahalo. Mahalo.